All right. Hi, guys. I'm going to just start talking. We'll leave some more people, hopefully, just to trickle in. Um, my name's Ellie. Uh, welcome to the finals crash course series. Just to definitely check, uh, there is a session for first years going off this evening at the same time. Just make sure you're definitely in the right chat for final years. Um, but lovely to see so many of you. Um, so today, uh, the aim of the session is to go over um, a range of surgical themed SBAs. And we've got uh, several different doctors who will be presenting this evening. And we're going to cover a variety of different topics. Um, I will start off by sharing the slides. So, um, and do for free, we want this to be a really interactive session. So um, you don't have to speak out if you don't want to, but you can pop your answers in the chat um, and it will just help make it a lot more interactive and help for you all. <coughs> Marvellous. Okay, so we're going to start off with upper GI and HPB. Uh, and this has been done by Sid. Pabani, um, who's working in London at the moment. Welcome to introduce yourself. Now. Hi guys, my name is Sid. I'm an F2 working in London. Uh, I've got about 10 or 11 questions this evening on upper GI HPB. I think for mine, uh, what my plan is, it, is I'll go to each slide, go to each question. If you want to take a minute or two, read, have an answer. I'm not too fussed whether you put it in the chat, whether you want to answer it out loud or whether you want to just have it in your own head. It's it's fine. And then we'll kind of go through the answer for each one. If anyone has any questions or anything, just interrupt me or put whatever you want on the chat. OK. Great. OK. So. Mm -hmm. So question one um, is what is the typical pattern of LFT results you see in a post hepatic jaundice patient? So again, just take a few moments here, have a look through and come up with your own answer. And then when everyone's ready, in about a minute or so, I'll explain. Great. So just one of the admins that's not screen sharing, if you just um, keep an eye on the chat and see if there's any answers. OK. Yeah, OK, so right, I'll explain now, guys. So the answer for this is option C. Uh, we'll go through why now. So for post hepatic jaundice, the, the reason we see that is because there's an obstruction in biliary dip drainage. So it's a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Conjugated because bile has been conjugated by the liver and the obstruction is following that. Now, what you see in post-hepatic jaundice is a high ALP and gamma GT. And that is a greater rise compared to the rise that you'll see in ALT and AST. So you'll still get a transaminitis, but if you had to compare the two, the ALP gamma GT rise is much greater than the ALT AST rise. Now, the reason you actually get an ALT AST rise in post hepatic jaundice is because biliary back pressure will cause a mild hepatocyte damage. So that's why you'll see a mild rise in ALT AST. But the main thing to look out for is ALP gamma GT, and that's going to rise quite high. OK, that's question one. Whenever you're ready, by the way, we can go to number two. So number two, have a, have a read of the question, have a look at the answers and come up with something and I'll describe it in about a minute or so. OK, so for this question, I think one thing to highlight here is you'll have this throughout medical school and finals and basically all exams. Is you have to look for the key things in the question. So what are the key points here? So for this one, it's painless mass in the right upper quadrant. Symptoms of pale urine and dark stool 
and the fact that you're noticing yellow sclera. So when you see all of these things, you need to be thinking about Corvassia's, or however you pronounce it, Corvassia's law, which is basically a palpable gallbladder in the presence of jaundice is unlikely to be gallstones, which is a fancy way of saying it's likely to be a pancreatic or other biliary cancer. So the answer for this is number four, it's a pancreatic CA. Now, the reason it's not number one is because for one, you'd expect constant pain in the right upper quadrant, an inflammatory response and a positive Murphy's on examination, which I've not given you in the question whatsoever. In number two, if the answer was number two, you need to look out for Charcot's tri triad and obstructive jaundice in the question, which is not there. And number three, biliary colic. So for that, you'll expect pain, which we're not getting here, but you will not get an inflammatory response that you will get an acute cholecystitis and acute cholangitis. So that's why it's four. Okay. Should have question three up there. Yeah, we've got question three. So question three relates to a gentleman who's got a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. GP asks you what sample can be requested to investigate for this diagnosis. You need to tell me which out of those four is the answer. So answer for question three is D as well. It's fecal elastase. So with chronic pancreatitis, it's a sort of longer term damage to the pancreatic parenchyma. And if you think about what the pancreas does, it has two functions, endocrine and exocrine. So in patients with chronic pancreatitis, you will see dysfunction in related to number one, endocrine, number two, exocrine. So endocrine might be patients present with diabetes. Um, exocrine function, exocrine dysfunction will lead to a will lead to low levels of digestive enzymes and fecal elastase is one of those. I think what's important is when you're investigating for patients with chronic pancreatitis, so this is quite an easy lab sample that can be sent off. For imaging, you're looking for calcification of the pancreas and that can be shown on x-ray, but the gold standard for this is CT scan. So question four is a 30 year old female comes to A&E. She's got right upper quadrant pain and fever. When you examine her, she is Murphy sign positive. Now with that, you should have a diagnosis in your head. And given the likely diagnosis, what are you going to expect when you do her bloods? So the answer for this is B. Um, the likely diagnosis here is acute cholecystitis. So there's an inflammatory response. Because of that, you're going to see a raised inflammatory marker. So the patient will have a high CRP and white cell count. There will be a raised ALP as well with an acute cholecystitis, and that's because there's distal duct occlusion. So there's cystic duct or neck of the gallbladder occlusion by a stone. You're unlikely to see a normal, you're likely to see a normal ALT in a bilirubin. Now, it, situations where you may get a bilirubin rise here are if there is a Maritzi syndrome. And a Maritzi syndrome is when a gallstone that is impacting on the cystic duct leads to compression of the common hepatic duct. As a result of that, you will get um, post-hepatic jaundice. So you'll see a rise in bilirubin and a rise in ALT as a result of hepatocyte damage due to the pressure. Okay, so next question is a 40 year old female comes to A&E, presents with retrosternal chest pain following episodes of severe vomiting. Um, Patient is quite unwell, you can't get a history from her, but the friend explains that she has been recently drinking very heavily. On examination, there's bilateral chest crackles. The patient's got a blood pressure of 90 systolic and a heart rate of 110. What do you think the underlying mechanism is for her presentation?
So the answer for this is A. Sorry, no, it's not. The answer for this is C, spontaneous rupture of the esophagus, which is also known as Borhave syndrome. Uh, the history described in the question is actually quite classical. So retrosternal chest pain, recent excess alcohol intake and vomiting, hemodynamic instability, and the chest crackles you get because there is sub subcutaneous emphysema, which is as a result of the esophageal rupture. Now, going through those answers, we can think about why it's not any of the others. So rupture of a uh, esophageal varices. Well, you know, the patient's hemodynamically unstable, is vomiting, has a background of alcohol excess. Potentially, yes, but there's no hematemesis described in the history there. Um, aortic dissection, the patient's got chest pain and they're hemodynamically unstable. But then I'm also giving you clues in the question related to recent episodes of vomiting, recent alcohol intake, that more goes in line with a Borhave syndrome than an aortic dissection. And acute inflammation of the pancreas, maybe. So we've got drinking heavily, we've got chest pain, patients with pancreatitis do get epigastric pain, but that can be mistaken or can radiate upwards and cause chest pain. But again, you know, the clues here being recent heavy alcohol in intake and episodes of vomiting more point to a Borhave syndrome picture. I think one thing to note is in terms of the examination being chest crackles, you can get that in an acute pancreatitis and that will be a result of a acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is quite a com not common, which is a severe complication of an acute pancreatitis picture. Okay. Okay, so next one. Next one is a 70 year old man who comes to hospital with abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation. On examination, he's got a distended abdomen, tinkling bowel sounds. You examine the groins and you see a hernia on the left hand side. A chest x ray is ordered, which looks like that. So, looking at that, looking at the history, looking at the chest x ray, what do you think the diagnosis is? So for this question, if you're seeing abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation, you should immediately be thinking about bowel obstruction. The question is, is this a small bowel obstruction or a large bowel obstruction? I've not given you, a, you know, a good sort of timeline of the history. So if you get a timeline of the history, it might give you clues to small versus large bowel obstruction. So in small bowel obstruction, they may present earlier with vomiting and later with constipation. In large bowel obstruction, it might be the other way around. However, if you look at the chest x-ray, it gives you the answer to, sorry, if you look at the um, abdominal x-ray, it gives you the answer to whether this is a small or large bowel obstruction. And here it's showing signs of a small bowel obstruction. So the signs to identify on this x-ray are number one, dilated small bowel loops, and that occurs proximal to the obstruction. Um, number two is the fact that these dilated loops are quite central in location so if you think about where the small bowel and the large bowel is large bowel might be more towards the sides small bowel is more central so we've got central dilated loops here and number three is you're seeing you're seeing valvuli uh, convientes or however you pronounce it also known as um, bowel folds present on the x-ray if you can look there so that's another sign of a bowel obstruction an important rule to note when you're looking at abdominal x-rays is the 369 rule. So three, so a small bowel should be under about three centimeters, large under six. Appendix is, uh, sorry, large under six and cecum under nine. So if you're actually looking at, looking at this in a work context and you've got packs up, you can actually measure, measure the bowel and look at how, look at how distended it is. Okay. Okay, so the next question relates to the same patient. So you've seen that patient with a consultant. They've reviewed it, reviewed her. Um, they're not too concerned that there are any signs of ischemia or perforation here. They ask you to start the patient on conservative management. Those three options I've given you here, what is the most uh, appropriate one?
Okay, so answer here is A. So you might have heard of the phrase drip and suck before. Uh, so that's what's good. So that relates to IV fluids and inserting an NG. So in these patients, because there's no sort of initial signs of bowel ischemia or a perforated viscous, you can manage them conservatively with the drip and suck approach. So that's inserting an NG, giving them fluids, inserting a catheter, monitoring a very strict fluid balance and correcting any electrolyte abnormalities. Now, the reason number two is wrong, well, the most obvious thing is we're allowing that patient to eat and drink. So just because you're starting a patient on conservative management, you have to be aware that this individual might eventually need an operation. So they might de uh, develop complications from their obstruction, being ischemia or perforation, which um, which will then be an indication for operating on them. So you're not going to allow them to eat and drink. C, surgical management, they're not quite there yet. They don't need surgical management at the moment. The, this individual might be able to get away with just conservative treatment. Now, if the patient had come, was extremely peritonitic, had a rising lactate, was in severe pain, you'd be more concerned about bowel ischemia or perforation, and that might lead you to consider earlier surgical management. However, in this case, we don't have any of those obvious signs. Okay, so next question. You see a 60-year-old gentleman who comes to clinic with a groin lump, and that's superior and medial to the pubic tubercle. Consultant tells you that's a direct inguinal hernia, and out of those four answers, can you explain the anatomy behind a direct inguinal hernia? So the answer here is B. So direct inguinal hernias will protrude through Hasselbach's triangle and they'll be medial to the, medial to the inferior epigastric artery. So I'm just going to go on a slight tangent here. Um, for this question, it requires you to know the difference between direct and indirect inguinal hernias, which interestingly, clinically, is not very relevant. But for finals and for OSCE examinations, you know, especially in my medical school, it was quite a, it was, it was, it was a topic that came up quite a lot. So, you know, you might be in a position now going into finals where you think, which bits of anatomy should I know? There's so much to choose from. In inguinal canal and inguinal hernias was a really important one for people in my medical school to get, um, get to grips with, because it came up not only in our um, papers, but it also came up in our OSCE hernia examination. So with the direct inguinal hernia, they will protrude through a defect in the posterior wall of the inguinal canal, and that's Hesselbach's triangle. And when you're looking at what are the differences between a direct and indirect, one of the ways of telling is looking at its relation to the inferior epigastric vessels. So direct or medial, indirect or lateral. OK, so next patient is 70 year old with a background of peptic ulcer disease, who's admitted to the emergency department with severe 10 out of 10 abdominal pain and generalized peritonitis. An abdo x-ray is done, this is it here, and given the x-ray, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? So just ag again in the que this question, and similar to the previous x-ray one, you should kind of already have an idea of what you think the diagnosis is from the history. And the x-ray is just going to kind of, um, is just going to give you 100% proof that you were correct. So in this case, the answer is a perforated peptic ulcer. So just looking at the history, what, are this, what, what am I giving you there that's pointing towards that? Well, this background of peptic ulcer disease is one particularly large clue. The fact that they've got severe 10 out of 10 abdominal pain and the fact that she's got generalized peritonitis on examination. On the x-ray, when on an abdo abdominal x-ray, with a, and if the patient has a perforated viscous, the sign you're looking for is known as Riegler's sign, which is also known as a double wall sign. And it's a sign of pneumoperitoneum, so air in the peritoneal cavity. And if you can look at the, at the arrows on this x-ray, I'm trying to show you that sort of double wall. 
And basically what that means is there's gas within the bowel lumen and there's gas within the peritoneal cavity. And you see that as a sort of two sides of the wall here. And those those arrows are going to show you points at where you can see that quite clearly. But like I said, for this one, a lot of it should, you know, can be good. It really can be got through the history. OK, so next one is a 45 year old man who's got a background of liver cirrhosis and he's come in with an upper GI bleed. It's very he's hemodynamically unstable. You're concerned that this is going to be a variceal bleed. Other than resuscitation, what other treatments can be given to manage variceal bleeding? And this is the key bit here at presentation. OK, so answer for this is B, so terlipressin and prophylactic antibiotics. So, you know, and I know that this patient needs an endoscopy. OK, so that's going to be that's going to be the definitive management for this gentleman. The issue is he's hemodynamically unstable, currently bleeding at the moment. So you need to resuscitate the patient before you can actually take them to endoscopy. When you when you're faced with a patient who's got a variceal bleed, initial management mainly is resuscitation. So putting out a major hemorrhagic core, um, giving them fluids, giving them blood. But the other two things you can give are terlipressin and prophylactic antibiotics. So terlipressin is a vasopressin agonist and it increases systemic vascular resistance. As a result of that, it decreases portal pressure. If there's a decreased portal vein pressure, you, there's a decreased pressure on the actual esophageal varices. Prophylactic antibiotics are given in a case of an upper GI, upper GI bleed because of the varices. And the reason is bacterial infections are pretty common in patients with variceal bleeding, uh, one of them being um, SBP. So for these patients, you get prophylactic, prophylactic antibiotics. OK, so next one is 30 year old male with no previous medical history. He's coming with abdominal pain, initially located centrally. It's now migrated to the lower right side. You examine him. He's tender maximally over McBurney's point. He's tachycardic and pyrexial. In view of the likely diagnosis, what other two signs can you look for on examination? So just to let you know, abdominal examination signs are another common thing that comes up in finals, both in written papers and in OSCE scenarios. Yes, the correct answer is B. So it's Roswings and so is sign. So Roswings is when you get pain in the right iliac fossa on palpation of the left iliac fossa. So a sign is where you get right iliac fossa pain with extension of the right hip. And the reason is, is because you have an inflamed appendix pressing on the psoas major. OK. Gray Turners and Cullens to do with acute pancreatitis. Murphy's is to do with acute cholecystitis. Caput Medusa is enlarged epigastric veins that occur because of portal hypertension. Fawani sign is my second name. Um, other learning points for patients with appendicitis that I think is important to be aware of is that no, you see in the history I've given you the sort of abdominal pain over three to four hours, starting centrally and migrating to the lower right side. So that is very textbook definition of it. The other thing is to look out for loss of appetite or anorexia. That's quite a common sign for these patients. Imaging in cases of a suspected acute appendicitis. There's no sort of clear cut answer here, actually, if you look at the guidelines. So this can be diagnosed clinically. You can use an ultrasound scan or you can use a CT. And management of these patients is prophylactic antibiotics and appendicectomy. Now, if you have a patient who just has a mass, an appendiceal mass, and there's no sort of overlying peritonitis, then you can give antibiotics and plan a later interval appendicectomy.
Okay, um, so I'm Chloe. I'm one of the F1s who's working at Torbay. Um, I've got TNO. Um, yeah, let's just. I, I, I seem to work fairly well for the last one. Um, there's five answers for every question. Have a think about it for a couple of seconds. I'll read out each question um, and give you a couple of seconds, and then I'll basically explain it. M moving on. Um, uh, so, a. I can only see half of my pose, but let's go with a 51 year old for the fun of it. Um, you're a female with a background in diabetes and lupus, a 10 ZD with a swollen knee. She said it's been swelling up in the last 24 to 48 hours and it's now very painful, hot and red. What should be your first step of management? So give oral steroids and stand home, give IV steroids and keep in hospital, let's say an observer at night, attempt to aspirate the joint space, send home with analgesia and safety netting advice, or give oral antibiotics and send home. I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat at the same time. Yeah, mine's also zoomed in. Whoever's just said that. Um, I think it's I, it might just be a thing to do with my makings of the slide, so we might just have to deal with it. I've, I'm try, I'll try and give you all, all the bits. So Ellie. Oh dear. I don't know whether my phone is just really not liking this. OK, well, in the absence of my my screen moving on. But, oh, there we go. <laughs> so the answer is attempt to aspirate the joint space in this case. I've given you a couple of red herrings about the background of, of autoimmune diseases like the diabetes and lupus in an attempt to kind of put you into the this is rheumatoid arthritis thought. In all honesty, this very much could be rheumatoid arthritis, um, particularly with this background of autoimmune. However, you it's swollen up quite quickly. It's hot and it's red. You need to be thinking, is this septic arthritis? Um, so and in order to do that, you need to aspirate the joint space. If you as I'm sure you know, if you've got if you put a patient who has um, un, who is unwell, who has an infection on steroids, that's not going to go down particularly well with them and they're going to get very, very unwell. Um, you yes, if it is arthritis, you will give steroids. You're quite right. Um, and you probably. In, in all of that's a rheumatology thing. It depends how 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 painful it is in terms of whether you need to keep keep them in or not. Um, but that's kind of the two that you'll be going for. For next, please. I hope this one works. Okay, I can again see half the question. This will be interesting. A twenty-three year old male is brought into ED having been in an RTA pedestrian versus car. When you perform the neuro exam on this man, you find he has no power or sensation of the left, upper and lower limbs. What sort of paralysis is this? So this should read quadriplegia as A, paraplegia for B, monoplegia for C, hemiplegia for D, or E being a traumatic brain injury paralysis. Okay. You good for the next? Does it work for the next one? Oh. oh, there we go. So this is just terminology of words. Um, hemiplegia is the entirety of one side, which this gentleman is having. Monoplegia, if you click on the next slide for me, Ellie, or the next thing, monoplegia, oh, I'll go one by one. Um, <laughs> so monoplegia is just one limb, paraplegia is all the lower limbs, and quadriplegia is all, all, all upper, upper and lower limbs. Um, traumatic brain injury paralysis is something that I have made up. I'm hoping it's not an actual thing that I happen to have made up and just don't know about. Um, but yes, it, this would be hemiplegia. This one's quite a simple quest of your how much you know your fractures. Quite simply, what type of fracture is this? And and somebody's managed to create a whole new modality which shows off fractures in a beautiful way.
Ellie? Okay, so the answer to this is a linear fracture. If you click the next slide for me, Ellie, you can see all the different types of fracture. Um, so as I'm sure you'll be aware, you know, the, the management of it depends on whether it is open slash compound or not. It, um, and obviously you'll be trying to be managing most of these conservatively that which you can, including particularly in, in young children there, they can set a lot easier almost. But you have to make sure in young children that you are going to set them correctly. I can't. Yeah. Um, but this is just a quite simple picture of which fractures what they look like. Next, please. Thanks, Ellie. Um, so you don't get any history on this one because history would be a bit of a giveaway. Um, the question is quite simply, what does this X-ray show? So does it show osteo of just one side? Does it show bilateral osteo, unilateral neck of femur, unilateral pelvic fracture, or is it a completely normal X-ray? And when you're ready, Ellie. So the most obvious is this right sided osteoarthritis of the hip. You can clearly see the osteophytes in, in that one and you can see them some sclerosis. Um, so you, the, the, the right side is more obvious. There is some osteo on the left hand side. It's much less obvious, but there's still narrowing of the joint space. Um, that you, much smaller than you would expect in usual. So you'd be un understood for just saying unilateral, but it is bilateral at the time. Next, please. Yeah, so joint test, there we go. So this is a delightful looking x-ray, and I, I like to hope if anybody of you who saw the, ever saw this x-ray, you slightly panic a little bit. Um, you're called to be part of a trauma call for a 31-year-old male who's been crushed by a pallet of bricks. This is his initial chest x-ray. This gentleman may need rib fixation in surgery, which is quite rare. Why? Okay, so the answer is something called a flail chest. And I, so flail chest is essentially where you have it, you there are certain grades which multiply the which take into account the number of rib fractures there are. And it essentially, in a way, creates its own tension pneumothorax. Because if you have a section of your ribs which don't move in and out with the rest of your rib cage, then every time you breathe in and try and inflate your lungs, um, and it, uh, then your the the pressure isn't there. It's not an, a, a withheld pressure chamber anymore. So e each time that intra Intrapleural, that's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, the, the, the pressure inside what's supposed to be your pleural cavity rises instead of your whole lungs expanding. It doesn't do that. It can sort of shrink. So it in itself tries, it tends to create a tension pneumothorax in itself. So it's one of the few occasions where you will actually rib fixate in surgery. You would never, there's no point in fixing it if it, by extreme pain. And honestly, it's probably going to be exactly the same pain side. Um, there would be no point in fixing it for hemothorax um, because you wouldn't, if your rib fractures are causing the hemothorax, it's likely to have pierced something in itself. So you'd fix that. Um, I mean, potentially your rib, your rib segments could have pierced the pericardium, um, potentially. Um, but if it's done that, then you're going to need a lot, something a lot, lot faster than rib fixation. Um, and yes, it is occasional, but you do fix them with surgery. Next, please. It's the middle of a shift, so this actually happened to me. Um, middle of a night shift, and you go to clerk a 54-year-old gentleman with a background of poorly controlled diabetes, whose initial complaint is painful foot. On examination, you find this. And I would, whoever, whenever you guys see your first one, it's one of the most smelly things you will ever see. It's probably one, one time in medicine where I've absolutely 
been made sure not to gag. And um, little, little tip in life, at the moment, we've got these beautiful COVID masks, which make, if you ever have a really strong smelling smell in a room, if you just put one of the COVID masks on, it does help a lot, but lot, a lot more. So there you go. Practical life tip for being an F1 and not gagging in front of your patient. So this is clearly not a very happy foot, but the, bear in mind where you are in the middle of a night shift, the skeleton sh shift, what do you do? You call a code, order an x-ray, call the ortho reg on call, bandage the foot and send home with antibiotics or order a CT foot. And what do you do first? OK, so the first thing you do is order an X-ray. And so you are going to do B, C and E. You're going to do them all. Um, and but it, it's almost an order of priorities. Yes, the orthopedic reg needs to know about this. They need to know about this because there is a strong possibility. It's either it, it's spread to the bones and, and um, that, you know, they've got either completely that their feet feet bones have been completely dissolved and then a potential of it spreading and, and leading to sepsis. So basically they're a potential of needing an amputation. Um, but the first thing you need to know is how much has it spread? How much bony invasion does it have? And then equally, as soon as they have an x-ray, they're almost certainly going to have a CT foot afterwards tonight. And it's exceedingly, exceedingly unlikely, Sasha, I would wager on impossible that an orthopedic reg is ever going to come in unless uh, until those things have have happened and i this this is yeah like i said I, I had this on one of my night shifts on acute med and actually this gentleman i found out died um a week or two later um so he did have an amputation um and he still managed to die from this so i was sorry there's a question from the chat did i involve vascular in honestly i would have um at that time of the night um, but it was the middle of the night. I had a choice of who do I call? Yeah, who 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 is the first person I want? I need to call. Um, and I don't want to uh, practically. I don't want to be the very unfortunate F1 who's woken up lots of seniors in the middle of the night um, when I, get, I only need to do one. So this needs senior attention, or it needs somebody senior to know about it definitely. And it, but because it's foot. Oh. And uh, sorry, I'm just trying to look at the second question. Um, if the orthopedics had said, oh, yes, I do. I would need I, I, I would like vascular to have a look at it. Then vascular could have a look at it. But this is first and foremost an ortho thing. Um, it's caused by this is a diabetic foot ulcer, which has got infected and got gangrenous and got nasty, um, which and spread to the bones. Next, please. OK, so this is still me, urology. 67 year old male attends your clinic experiencing episodes of incontinence. He says he often finds himself losing small amounts of urine just before and after he goes to the loo. When he does go, he only urinates a little and for a short period of time. What type of incontinence is this? Giggle incontinence, urge incontinence, mixed incontinence, overflow incontinence or functional incontinence? So the answer to this is overflow incontinence and I, I'm going to go through them one by one. So giggle incontinence is actually a thing which I learned new for this. It's uh, incontinence which happens only when you laugh in the absence of stress incontinence. So stress incontinence is uh, uh, losing urine when you are, you know, any pressure is sort of exerted on the bladder and is is uh, urge incontinence is overactive bladder. Um, overflow incontinence, it's kind of a, a combination of two things going on at once. The main thing is that their, their bladder um, gets very, very full and, and your bladder muscles are, are too weak to hold that much urine. So they, you'll leak beforehand and you'll leak after is because your bladder muscles are not strong enough to squeeze all your urine out. Hence, you're leaking afterwards. Functional incontinence is caused by a different physical or a mental disability, i.e. I can't actually get to the loo in time because I'm in a wheelchair and that's why I lost my, I, I am incontinent. Uh, 
Okay. What form of incontinence is usually treated pharmacologically initially? Similar questions to last time. Uh, sorry, similar answers even. Content, continuous incontinence, stress incontinence, urge incontinence, functional incontinence, or overflow incontinence. So the answer to this one is urge incontinence. Oh, I, I, I might be giving you guys all. Yeah, that's right. I might be giving you guys a little bit too short answer, time to answer it. But I'm hoping you'll be able to answer it in your own head. So urge incontinence is because it's caused by overactivity of the blood and muscles itself. There's no real alternative way we found to properly initially try and treat it. So the way you do it is your anti-muscarinics. Anti Stress incontinence is your Kegel exercises, and I'm sure you've all been told by the now as final fifth years that every woman on the planet should be practicing Kegel exercises from the day they're born, and even the men as well. Um, continuous incontinence is, is treat the cause, treat what's, what's causing it, but you're, you're, it's unlikely to need pharmacological. It, just, it depends what it is. Equally functional incontinence, it depends what's causing their incontinence, so you just need to treat the cause. And overflow incontinence is usually caused by anatomical structural problems, which aren't going to be solved by pharm pharmacology, aren't going to be solved by drugs. So your bladder retraining is, is are you, which one are you referring to? So that's almost in, in itself Kegel exercise as a sort. If you're going to do bladder retraining, you'll, oh, I see what you mean, as in, going earlier and and not drinking so much and that sort of thing isn't that used for overactive bladder so you can use that as a combination of things but again because it's mostly caused by um your your bladder is almost overexcited the the most common thing you will start doing with is pharmacology and you you can try it depends how pushed you are as a gp <laughs> um and and put in some some bladder training as well next please nice simple picture of the prostate what zone do 70 percent of prostate cancers origin originate from so you need to know not only what are the, the zones of the of the prostate, but also which is most likely to originate cancer from. Ellie? The answer is B, um, and you can kind of tell this um, if you click the next slide as well. Um, because when you're able to diagnose a lot of or detect a lot of um, prostate cancers with DREs. Um, so most cancers form in the peripheral zone and it's the, the peripheral zone, a little bit of the central zone, but mainly the peripheral zone, which you're going to be able to feel in a DRE. Um, you're not going to be feeling the rest. It also makes sense as to why most people with prostate cancers, not uh, one of their original things might be might be struggling to pee, but it's very rarely one of the original things is struggling to ejaculate. And as you can see, it's your central zone, which if you that started to swell, um, would sort of um, uh, block your ejaculatory duct. A 35 year old with a history of recurrent UTIs attends the SRU surgical receiving unit with intense left sided flank pain. She's had lo lower urinary tract symptoms for a couple of days and hasn't yet been to the GP for this. Her urine dip is positive for nitrites, leukocytes and blood. You diagnose pyelonephritis but are concerned by the amount of pain she appears to be in and suspect she might have a calculus as well. What substance would be most likely to be present in a stone in this lady? This one's a hard one. This one's a typical finals. Why do I really need to know this? Um, but it's, it's in the medical knowledge, so I guess you, you are forced to learn it. And um, so the answer to this is struvite. Your most common stones are made from calcium. 
Um, but the clue to this one is that she's got an infection at the same time and she's got a history of recurrent UTIs. So struvite stones can also be known as infection stones. And they're the stones that become the staghorn calculi, which you see are so classical on x-rays. Um, and the, the stones which are very likely to cause the bigger problems. So yes, calcium are the most common stones. Uric acid are common in those with who are all, who also have risk factors for things like gout, understandably, uric acid in the same same family. Um, so and then cysteine stones are only really occur in those with the family trait of cysteine urea, the um, genetic condition. Um, and thrombosis is there, which most people would view would laugh at. However, if you've had, so I had a patient a, a couple of weeks ago who had absolutely classic renal colic. I was absolutely convinced her um, CT was going to give a stone. She had blood in her urine, absolute horrific pain. She never usually went into hospital. Um, it was very much clearly loin to groin. Um, but her CT was completely normal. Um, and so I got told by the reg at that time that apparently if you have just a, a, a blood clot in your ureters, it can be just as painful as a stone. But unfortunately, there's there's nothing we can really do about it. Um, but equally, this lady could just have polynephritis. I've seen another lady who did just have pyelonephritis. We, she was in an awful lot of pain. It seemed far too much pain for just pyelonephritis. CTK beat her and she didn't have anything. Now, she could technically have had a thrombus um, as well, but it, it, pyelonephritis can be really painful. So this it could be any of that. Next, please. Which of the following statements is true about Wilms tumours? A, they rarely affect children under five years old. B, it commonly affects both kidneys. C, about 50% of those who develop a Wilms tumour will also have a defect. Birth defect, that is, sorry. D, chemotherapy is rarely a treatment for Wilms tumours. And E, the most, pain, the most common symptom of a presenting Wilms tumour is an abdominal mass or abdo pain. Why is it obviously not a kidney stone? What I'm sorry, what do you mean? Why does it? Could you explain that question? If it's easier, you can just unmute. I really okay. I'm really sorry. I don't understand that question. If you retype it and pop it in, then I can try and answer it. Um, but I'll answer this one at the moment. So the following statement is true about a Wilms tumor is E. The most common presentation is generalized abdo mass or abdo pain. Actually, an abdo mass is more common than abdominal pain for a presenting Wilms tumor. So the most they most commonly affect people children who are ages three to four. Um, the the ta instances tailor down massively as soon as you, you are five and over. Um, hardly ever affects both kidneys. Um, five percent of those who who have a Wilms tumor also have a birth defect, which is lower than you might well, I might have expected. And everybody, so they are graded into low, medium, and high, um, as you might expect in terms of the their aggression and the the size they are, etc. But regardless of even whether you're low risk. Um, of either recurrence or of its spread, your uh, children are almost universally treated with four weeks of chemo for a Wilms tumour. And yes, most people with a Wilms tumour look well. They, they, they just present with general abdo pain or an abdo mass. There's nothing really specific. There are obviously big complications and they can present as very, very unwell, but most of the time they don't. Next, please. So which of the following are true relating to carcinomas of the prostate? A, they're, typical, they're typically squamous carcinomas. B, prostate cancers are graded histologically using a Gleason score. C, they're not usually influenced by hormone manipulation. 
D, they common, commonly cause rectal compression, or E, it is the second, second most common cause of cancer in men. So I'm looking the one which uh, I'm looking for the one which is true. So the answer is they're commonly graded by a Gleason score, which I will have a picture up for the moment. So they are the most common um, cause of cancer. Uh, they very, very rarely cause rectal compression. You have to have got past a level. It has to have a decent level of um, spreadage. Um, <laughs> that to be the case, and they're usually adenocarcinomas. Um, there's a picture of the Gleason score coming up, which I'm sure is going to be very, very small on everybody's screens, but it essentially looks at the differentiation of cells um, and, and one, the way one, one might in most cancers. Next, please. And that's it. <laughs> Um, I hope it was useful. Um, if anybody has any questions, oh, I'll try and see if one has been asked. I see. Yeah. Um, just how come it couldn't be a kidney stone? Um, I, if you're referring to the previous one, that so it was a kidney stone I, I i really don't understand what what the question is how come it wasn't a kidney stone so this lady did have a kidney stone of the two ones that i was talking about um there, there's no if a, somebody's in that amount of pain there's no way you can say absolutely is not a kidney stone your your um your modality of choice is ctkub and oh i'm assuming you mean no, so a CTKUB is pretty specific. They 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 can see almost all. It's it's incredibly rare for you to still have a stone if your CTKUB is negative. Um, I'm not sure if that's answered your question. I'm really sorry. I, I can't tell what your question was. Um, Oh, I see. I see. OK, yes, the, the th thrombus is not a kidney stone. That's what I mean. Um, it, when I say what what it, you think they have a renal calculator, thrombus is obviously not a kidney stone, but it can behave and feel as if it's a kidney stone. That makes sense. OK, um, I think that's it. I'll start again. So these were written by Elisa, who's an obstetrician Garni Reg. She's been called into work emergency this evening, so I will be presenting her slides. Um, so the first question um was the reflexes difficult to elicit are not a feature of severe preeclampsia um headache and visual disturbance are particularly you know suggestive features of preeclampsia um, and any woman uh, particularly in later stages of her pregnancy who's got these symptoms you need to investigate further check her blood pressure um and if it's high you need to admit her and, and give her treatment um you can also get epigastric pain and low platelets. There's something called HELP syndrome that you may have heard of. Um, that, by definition, is uh, low platelets, but you can also get it as a feature of preeclampsia. But reflexes being difficult to elicit would not be a feature that we would expect to find. OK, so next question. A woman is 30 weeks pregnant. She presents with severe persistent itching. She has a background of hay fever and eczema. She's been using emollient creams, but she's not found these helpful. On examination, you see marked excoriation of her hands. Which test would be the best test to carry out for her? I'm going to assume we've got some answers in the chat. And I can't see. So uh, the correct answer is LFTs. So you can get um, what um, you can get raised LFTs and um, sort of inflammation um, in the bile ducts in pregnancy. Um, this tends to resolve on delivery, um, but it's important to investigate um, and sort of we usually treat the symptoms of this. But you do have to monitor these women if they've got raised LFTs because um, it can lead to a high risk of stillbirth and sort of premature delivery. So we tend to just monitor them. Um, also, if women have uh, these sort of symptoms, they tend to get them recurrent in future pregnancies as well. So it's something to be aware of. 
um, if they're coming back um, with future pregnancies. Okay, so 24 year old woman who is 10 weeks pregnant presents for a review. Her blood pressure is 126 over 82. So what is the most likely thing to happen to her blood pressure during her pregnancy? OK, so the correct answer is A. So um, initially, um, the blood pressure falls in the first half of pregnancy, and this is due to increased levels of certain hormones, um, such as progesterone. Um, this then, as the pregnancy progresses, um, this will increase back to pre-pregnancy levels. So um, she's 24, uh, depending on her sort of um, previous blood pressure before she got pregnant that might actually be quite a normal blood pressure for her anyway um but if it's a little bit lower than her normal that's not too, too concerning as long as later on in her pregnancy it's it's going back up to its normal So a woman presents to clinic for a review at six, 36 weeks pregnant as she was found to have a breech presentation at 32 weeks. Her baby is found to still be in the breech position. So what is the most appropriate management that we can offer her? OK, so the answer to this one is B. So it will go through the answers. So reassure her that the baby will turn spontaneously sometimes earlier um, in the pregnancy. Um, for example, at the 32 week mark, we let her carry on a little bit to see if the baby turns spontaneously. Um, so at 32 weeks, there's a chance that the baby can turn spontaneously. However, we're now at 36. It's very unlikely this, that this baby is going to turn itself around. Um, a C-section, you know, she's still, we can still try rotating the baby, option B. Um, if that doesn't work, we might offer her a C-section, but I don't think we're quite there at this point. Um, D, um, D is very risky, as you might imagine. Um, we want to avoid a breach delivery if at all possible. And there's a bonus question here. So what investigation might you send this child for after birth? And I'm really sorry, if you know the answer, you're gonna have to shout it out because I can't see your typing. OK, so the answer um, is further investigation for um, dysplasia of the hip. Um, so babies that are um, breech, um, particularly if they're female, particularly if there's a history of um, hip dysplasia that's running sort of in the family, um, they need to be investigated further for that. Um, and GPs do that anyway. Um, when the baby goes for their six week check, they check for hip instability. Um, and if there's any found, then there's further investigations done from there. OK, so a slightly different um, tangent of, of OBS and gynae question. So a 55 year old woman presents to you because her friend has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So which of the following is most associated with a risk of developing ovarian cancer? OK, so the answer to this one is A. So ovarian cancer is it, one of the risk factors is increased oestrogen exposure, um, similarly to breast cancer. Um, early um, periods mean that the levels of oestrogen are sort of higher at an earlier age um, and presumably for a longer period of time in that woman's life. So the higher exposure to oestrogen means that they are more at risk. Early menopause is not a risk because that is 
really less estrogen exposure than if they have their menopause later. Combined oral contraceptive pill, yes, it is an estrogen exposure. However, um, conversely, and I honestly can't quite remember the reason why, in breast cancer, it slightly increases the risk of getting breast cancer, taking the combined oral contraceptive. However, it actually lowers your risk slightly of getting ovarian cancer. Multiple pregnancies, again, is less estrogen exposure overall than having um, sort of no children or late pregnancies. And low BMI, um, sort of having a high BMI does put you at higher risk for cancers, including ovarian cancer, but not specifically just that. OK, so next question. So a 27 year old woman phones her GP for advice. She's currently taking the Desogestrel, which is the pop for contraception, and she normally takes the pill at 9 a.m. every day. But she's forgotten to take it this morning. So what should you advise her to do? OK, so the answer to this one is D. So um, it's still within the window of time um, where she can carry on her pills and, and doesn't need any further contraception. Um, if it's sort of more than one missed, fully missed pill, so it's more than a day late, um, then she needs to sort of use extra contraception. Or if she's had sex recently, she needs to think about emergency contraception. It's way too early to perform a pregnancy test. Um, and as we've said, she's still within that safety window. So she can take her missed pill uh, now and then she doesn't need to take any any further action. So with that one, sorry, I'll say one more thing. So it's just important to learn um, the contracept, the combined contraceptive pill. The rules are slightly different. You can get away with a little bit longer. I think for the progesterone only pill, it's it's just the one day max. Um, Whereas for the combined pill, sometimes you can miss um, sort of more than one pill, although it depends where in the pack that you you miss them. OK, so that's all our Ops and Gynae questions. I'm so hi, everyone. My name is Lizzie. Um, I'm one of the F1 doctors and I'm currently on general surgery. Um, so I'm going to do colorectal first, then I'll touch on ENT and it's just some case based case based questions. So um, let's start. OK, so case one is a 21 year old um, presenting with two days of abdominal pain, nausea, anorexia. Her last period was two weeks ago. On examination, she's got temperature of 38, heart rate 95, um, blood pressure 180, generalised tenderness, maximal in the right upper quadrant, McBurney sign positive. Initial test, urine dip negative, pregnancy test negative. What initial investigation, if any, would you do to support your diagnosis? So I'll give you a couple um, seconds to think about it and then we'll do the answer. <coughs> Just give me a shout when you want to move on. Yeah, so we have the answer. OK, so the answer is B um, and this is about appendicitis. So you've got which is extremely most common cause of an acute abdomen in the younger generation um, and it had all the common symptoms in the question so it had this pain, um, nausea and anorexia so loss of appetite with it you can also get fever and then the signs which um, were touched on earlier you can get McBurney sign, Robbing sign, obturator sign and the psoas sign um, you might also be able to feel a mass and that's if any abscess is formed and then if your abdomen is quite rigid and tense um, that's when it's become peritonitic. Your investigations want to do a urine dip to rule out um, any urinary tract infection, pregnancy de test to rule out any kind of ectopic pregnancy, you want to do your inflammatory markers and then um, investigations 
you can basically in the younger males you'll go straight on to a clinical diagnosis and you'll usually state the treatment to theater in elderly patients more older patients and in females you might want to do a CT abdomen or an ultrasound um, to rule out any other causes um, such as the varying causes and then management is um, take into theatre and take out the appendix and always do um, take off to histology as well. So then case two. So I'll let you have a read. So it's 78 year old male. He's coming with abdominal distension. His bowels haven't opened for four days and he's unable to pass gas. Um, he's feeling sick, but he hasn't vomited. Um, those are his observations. His abdomen is extremely distended, but it's soft um, and he's got tinkling bound sounds. You, you suspect obstruction and order an X-ray. This is the X-ray. Um, so what is your definitive management of this cause of bowel obstruction? So if we go into the answer. OK, so this is um, volvulus. So the answer is D and um, you'll see it quite often on the general surgeon um, ward. Um, so in general, low bowel obstruction can be caused by colorectal cancers, but also volvuluses, strictures, if it's diverticular or an IBD. Your symptoms will be the classic um, abdominal pain, distension, nausea, vomiting, bowels not opening and um, then plus or minus any of the causes that can be um, causing it um, and then your signs will be the distension tinkling bowel sounds um, your investigations you'll do bloods um, BBG for lactate because you want to know whether the bowel is ischemic or not and then you'll do your abdominal x-ray um, in this case it was the volvulus um, and in volvulus you'll manage it by um, trying to decompress it originally um, and you can do that with a flatus tubes or a flexible um, sigmoidoscopy um, but other causes depending on the cause they might have different managements in low bowel obstructions okay so yeah. next question yeah. oh I've got a question yeah, so case three um, is with a lovely picture. So it's a 45 year old male presented to GP for two weeks of a fresh PR bleeding um, when he goes to the toilet. It's associated with pain and uh, constipation. He's noticed an intentional three kilogram weight loss in the past um, two months. Family history of colorectal cancer. On examination, you notice this. Um, so what would be your initial management again for this patient? Yep, should we go to the answer? Yep. So um, this is a question on hemorrhoids. So the, that picture was showing a hemorrhoid. Um, tried to give you a couple of red flags in there with the weight loss and the family history of colorectal cancer um, but ultimately it's hemorrhoids and um, just to go through hemorrhoids etiology it's usually by straining um, or any kind of increased abdominal pressure so those that are more at risk are those constipation diarrhea or other, the causes of these high intra-abdominal pressures are pregnancy and ascites your common signs and symptoms, you'll get this PR bleeding. And it's a really common cause of PR bleeding and it will typically be this bright red blood um, when wiping or in the pan. And um, they'll also have some pain and discomfort and they'll have this constipation or feeling like they're not emptying properly. Um, your main investigation will be a PR examination. Um, and then your management. So your initial management for all hemorrhoids doesn't matter what grade there are. It should always be to offer the patient lifestyle and dietary advice. Um, so they need to increase their fibre intake to avoid constipation and also increase their fluids. And then depending on the grade it is, you can then offer them further management. Um, so grade one is when it's within the anal canal and um, then you can offer some um, topical steroids. It then goes to grade two, grade three, where it's protruding um, beyond the anal canal, but you 
um, it can spontaneously reduce or um, manually reduce, then you might want to offer further management like band ligation and then grade four where it protrudes and it's irreducible, that's when you'd be offering a hemorrhoidectomy. Okay, so the next case. Uh, so case four, so 65 year old that presents with three days of pure bleeding, associated with diarrhea. It's fresh blood that's mixed within the stool um, when passing stool. No pain, no fever, nausea or vomiting. He's had some bloating and constipation for two weeks. Um, there's his past medical history um, and on examination. It's a soft non-tender abdomen um, and his PR examination is unremarkable. So what do you think is the most likely cause of this patient's presentation? So if we move on. So it's probably most likely diverticular disease. Um, so you've, you've got this elderly patient that's got this PR bleeding and kind of the, the clue is that it's blood that's fresh blood that's also a bit mixed within the stool but also they've got this kind of IBS picture um, where it's kind of this in between Typically, it's where they go, they'll uh, kind of change from diarrhea to constipation, and they might also have bloating there as well. So it's IB, this IBS picture, but in an elderly patient, um, and it's a multifactorial cause. So usually, um, it will be obesity, but also typically it's a low fiber diet, um, and so. You've got diverticulosis, which you just have the outpouching and that will be asymptomatic. Once it goes to diverticular disease, that's when they're symptomatic. So they might have um, abdominal pain, the constipation, the diarrhea. They might have painless PR bleeding. When it goes to diverticulitis, that's when it's infection and inflammation. And that's when you'll have this very short history of um, typically the left iliac fossa pain um, with, the, with the fever. So investigations, um, it's most likely an incidental finding on a scan, um, but a lot of the time it will present acutely as diverticulitis, in which case you'll want to do a CT, um, and in other cases you might want to do a colonoscopy. And then you, if they're presenting acutely with diverticulitis, you need to get your inflammatory markers, BBG for lactate and any kind of abdominal x-ray just to make sure they haven't perforated. And then the management, so if they're asymptomatic, then you just offer them lifestyle modification. If they're symptomatic diverticular disease, then it's just symptomatic again, so lifestyle and pain relief. Um, and it's important that in diverticular disease, you don't give NSAIDs because that actually increases their risk of perforating. And then once they go to diverticulitis, it depends whether they're complicated. That means complications such as abscesses, perforations, in which case you want to admit them into hospital for IV antibiotics and definitive management. If it's uncomplicated, then the GP can potentially um, manage that themselves with a short course of um, oral antibiotics along with the um, pain relief and any kind of laxative. Okay, should we move on to the next case? So, case five, it's a 24 year old male, presents GP with anal pain, and um, he describes it as a sharp tearing sensation when passing stool with intermittent blood when wiping. He's noticed a five kilogram weight loss in two months and he feels fatigued. GP gives lifestyle advice, but he returns one week later with the same symptoms. What would be the next best management? So should we go to the answers? Um, so this is quite a classic presentation of anal fissure. Um, so the difference between kind of uh, anal fissure 
anal fissure pain and hemorrhoids is in fissures you get this classical um, tearing and sharp pain when passing stool and it's usually caused by um, ripping of the the epithelium um, and that can be caused by constipation any kind of trauma and um, childbirth and it's this tearing sensation pain with PR bleeding um, you kind of your investigations is an examination but you would rarely do a PR examination because it's extremely painful for the patient and then the management is lifestyle um, changes and pain relief and then if after um, one week that's not working you can give them um, topical uh, GTN um, cream Okay, and yep, next case. This is a 35 year old a male that presents with a uh, past medical history of ulcerative colitis, presents to A&E with bloody diarrhea seven times a day with pain. His PR examination, you find blood on the finger. Um, observations are there in front of you guys. Um, and on examination, his abdomen is soft, tenderness and bowel sounds what is the next immediate investigation you should order so should we go to the answer so i picked um answer b um and this is because in a patient with ulcerative colitis, most trusts will have a, a checklist. And one of the most important investigations you need to get is an abdominal x-ray, because every patient immediately needs to have risked um, to ruled out this complication, which is toxic megacolon, because that can be a surgical emergency because there is serious risk of perforation. Um, Answer C, which was faecal calvitectin, that's more of an investigation you'd be doing in the, the GP to diagnose ulcerative colitis, but we already know that um, the patient's got that. Uh, a CT um, is a good investigation to get, but that might be, you might be doing it further down the line, and if this patient had um, presented peritonitic, you'd go for an abdominal x-ray first. Flexible sigmoidoscopy, they will need to have that at some point um, to see how much inflammation they're having ulcerative colitis. But again, it's not the immediate investigation you order. You might do, uh, you definitely do a group and save and cross match um, because you probably need to trans um, fuse blood for this patient. Um, but again, you can give them O negative in the meantime and abdominal x ray, you'd definitely be doing that straight away. And then the when the surgeons would get involved is when it's severe ulcerative colitis, when medical management hasn't worked, or if you see this in abdominal x-ray. So case nine, or the next case. Okay. Um, so it's the 57-year-old woman presents the GP with an abdominal lump. The lump is five centimetres above the umbilicus. It's round and seven centimetres in size. It's partially reducible and soft. She um, denies pain or weight loss um, and she's opening the bowels. She had a cholecystectomy and a laparotomy in the past. Um, what is the lump most likely? So if we move on to the answer. Um, so this is kind of a question on abdominal wall and hernia. So the most likely answer is E, um, an incisional hernia. Um, and that's because the really because of the location. So it's the laparotomy is a scar that goes down the abdomen. Uh, it's five centimetres above the umbilicus. So it's not going to be an umbilicus hernia. Um, it's not, it doesn't describe the um, inguinal uh, region um, and it also is, it's not in the epigastric area. It's not quite high enough to be in the epigastric. So it's most likely going to be in the incisional with that past history of a laparotomy. Um, and just so you know, uh, answer C, a St. Mary's Joseph node. Um, that's actually a lymph node you get with, um, I believe it's certain type of gastric cancers. 
Um, and then just to touch on hernias, um, it's usually a lump and swelling. And it's really important with hernias when you're an F1 to ask about um, any symptoms of obstruction. So that's bowels not opening, or any kind of nausea and vomiting. And then um, management, um, you can surgically um, reduce it if it's symptomatic and um, any complications such as incarcerated or um, obstructing. Let's move to the next case. So case eight, um, so this is a 58 year old uh, woman is presenting to a &E with severe abdominal pain and fever. It's associated with one week history of bowels not opening and she's um, nauseous and vomiting. Her abdomen, it's a tense abdomen, it's really tender on palpation. She has rebound tenderness and she's guarding. Observation is just tachycardic, she's hypertensive and she's um, got temperature of 38.2. So what is your definitive investigation? Should we go to the answer? So the answer is D and the the main word is the definitive investigation, so the investigation that's going to give you um, the cause of this um, lady's pain, not your initial investigation. And so she's presenting with peritonitis, so she's got this rigid uh, abdomen, there's guarding, there's rebound tenderness. So in any patient that presents like this, um, you need to immediately get a CT abdomen because you need to know what's causing it. And the most common causes of a peritonitic abdomen that you should be thinking of, um, is any kind of perforation, so a bowel, ulcer, any kind of severe inflammation, and that can be anything from appendicitis to pancreatitis, any kind of bleeding, um, such as a triple A, and they present with this really severe pain. And typically, it's pain that's increased on movement and, bre and breathing when they take deep breaths in they'll have this fever and then their bowel sounds might not be present and this extremely rigid abdomen this is a, uh, an emergency surgery you need to get an urgent ct um abdomen pelvis and then obviously you'd also do all those other investigations to help try and find the cause of it so, and how much inflammation is there and again the lactate for um kind of the um, level of severity and then your management so your initial management is going to be supportive so you're going to give IV fluids resuscitate them start them on some really strong broad spectrum antibiotics blood products if they need them and then they're going to have to go in for emergency surgery um, if it's a colorectal cause most likely they're going to end up with a Hartman's procedure get to the next case so case nine so it's a 75 year old male presents to Amy with this um, diffuse abdominal pain um, some PR bleeding and diarrhea. He's denied weight loss, nausea, vomiting, and he's got no um, lower urinary tract symptoms. He's got a significant past medical history, hypertension, high cholesterol and a recent heart attack. And so his observations are stable. He's got mild to moderate abdominal tenderness um, and it's maximal on your left hand side. Um, PR is NAD. What's the most likely cause of his presentation? So should we get to the answer? So this is most likely ischemic colitis um, and different types is acute and chronic. Um, and so in terms of acute, um, the risk factors are those patients with um, AF, they previously had a heart attack or they've got um, any kind of vasculitis or a triple A. And that's because these are the risk factors for patients to have um, embolic events. So they're more likely to have an embolus that will um, break off, um, go into the um, mesenteric vessels um, and um, cause this colit um, ischemic colitis. And the kind of the clue in this question was that the patient had really severe abdominal pain, um, but it wasn't quite in keeping with the examination findings. Um, 
and so they have really severe pain but their examination might not be in um, proportion to the, their symptoms and you immediately want to um, investigate with a CT angiogram um, and also do that lactate to see the level of ischemia. Um, again initially your management with IV fluids, antibiotics and then depending on the cause you have different surgical interventions so embolectomies, bypasses or even if they go in and they find lots of necrotic bowel and um, then they'll have to do a bowel resection. So let's move on to the next question. So case 10, so it's a six, seven year old man uh, presenting colorectal clinic with a new diagnosis of colorectal cancer. You're reviewing the histology and scans. Histology um, shows it's penetrating through the muscularis propria and reaching the serosa. The scan shows a large mass in the sigmoid colon, but no lymph nodes or distant metastases. What's the Duke stage? Go to the answer. And so this is a question of um, colorectal cancer and it's mainly about the Duke staging. So obviously for all the different causes of colorectal cancer, um, it'd be genetic, um, environmental, um, and your symptoms will be the typical weight loss and change in bowel habits. Investigations you'll be doing, your um, CT tap, um, colonoscopy to get that biopsy and the management it will be different types of surgical rese resection um, Duke's criteria is a typical stage that's used um, and so that depends on um, where it's penetrating through um, the, the muscle wall so it's only actually Duke stage A to D so A is when it's just going through to the um, mucosa and um, C, B is when it's penetrating into the, the muscle layer. C is when it goes through the muscle layer into the serosa, which is the outer layer of the bowel, um, that fatty layer. And then D is when it's either gone to a lymph node or metastasized elsewhere. And then should we move to the next question? Um, so I think this is the last case, so it's an 85 year old man presents the wall with um, bowel obstruction secondary to a volvulus, so the case we had it earlier on. Um, he has a past medical history of severe constipation. Um, you stop the stimulant laxative, which is definitely what you'd be doing in bowel obstruction, you don't give them stimulant laxatives. So which of the following do you stop? So it's just a question to know whether you guys know the names of your laxatives. So move to the answers. So these are the four different types of laxatives that you'll get to know when you guys are F1s and it's good to know for the PSAs as well. Um, I don't think you guys have done that. So you get your bulk forming laxatives. So that's when you um, want to increase the pressure in the colon and kind of um, make the stool bulky so it pushes down and you get that urgency. You then got the um, osmotic ones um, and that's when you might have lots of really hard poo and you want to um, draw out all the water and soften it up so it's easier to pass. Then you'll get your stimulants, so your stimulants will be your, like your, your senna um, and that stimulates your bowels and so that gets them moving to actually push it out and then you'll get soft softeners um, and those ones usually you'll, you'll put in um, rectally just soften up the stool. Okay, so I think that's all our colorectal questions. So now um, there's some more ENT questions. Yeah, um, sorry if it seems a bit rushed guys, I'm just a bit conscious of the time. Um, so if you do have any questions, just put them in the chat. But let's move into ENT. So um, I'll let you have a read of the case.
So there's the audio gram, what's the most likely cause of his hearing loss? And then um, answers from A to E. Move on to the answer. Yeah. Um, so these are typical. Oh, yeah. So these are um, typical pictures of audiograms, and um, that's quite good to just know off the top of your mind. So you've got noise induced. So that's when you kind of, when you're higher pitch, it will start to go down. But you kind of get this little um, reverse tick um, in noise induced. Then you've got the next one after that is um, old age hearing, and that's that gradual decline um, in um, in hearing in the higher um, tones. Meniere's disease, it will be the opposite. So it's those um, lower frequency tones. And then otosclerosis, you get this very typical picture here um, between um, conduction and uh, in between your bone and um, your nerves and it's actually called Carhartt's notch. Um, so those are typical pictures that's just good to just know off the top of your head. So should we move on? So case two is a four-year-old boy that presents right-sided ear pain associated with hearing loss and he's also got some discharge coming out. When you pull on the earlobe it produces pain What's the most common organism that's causing this type of infection? <coughs> Get to the answer. OK, so I think we we're going for the C is the causing bacteria, but that's the condition that's yeah. causing. Yeah. 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 So the answer is C. So um, that's the most common bacteria which will cause this presentation, which is a typical presentation of a uh, otitis um, externa, so outer ear infection. Um, and the kind of the clue in this um, question was uh, you get the pulling on the earlobe produces pain on examination and then you get um, discharge as well. Uh, it's a clinical diagnosis and you usually give topical antibiotics and pain relief and it's really common in um, children and any kind of trauma to the ear and swimming. Next question. So case three, you're a trainee and GP and you've got an eight month old baby who is extremely irritable for the past 24 hours. Mum can't settle her. Um, an examination temperature is 37.9 and the when you look uh, otoscopy and um, this is the picture that you can see here in the left ear. Um, so how would you manage the condition that you can um, see? Get to the answer. So this is compared to the last time, which was outer ear infection. This is inner ear infection, um, and it's very common in uh, again babies. Um, and the most common cause this time it's uh, S uh, pneumonia. Um, and the symptoms will be the kind of this ear pain and fever. You don't typically get the symptoms that you'll see with outer ear infection like um, pus or discharge unless the eardrum um, tears in which you then do and then you'll also get hearing loss so it will typically be those symptoms and then all of a sudden they might get extreme pain and a pop and then they'll start to get discharge and hearing loss and um, it's again it's a clinical diagnosis looking in the ear first line with inner ear infection and you'll just watch and wait because most are going to resolve after three to four days and um, if after then it hasn't resolved you get a perforated uh, eardrum 
or they're under two years old with bilateral infections or using your clinical judgment, they're severely unwell, so they're septic, that's when you choose to treat with antibiotics. But otherwise, just a watch and wait. <clears throat> so go to the next case. Oh, oh, and that's just complications of um, inner ear infections. Uh, it's good to might get asked on uh, ischies and stations. Uh, there's quite a few, so you can get a mastoiditis, and that would be a red swelling behind the ear. That's an urgent CT IV antibiotics. You can get a meningitis, and then you can get a chronic inner ear infection. So if we move on to the case. So it's a 21 year old that presents to ENT clinic with four week history of a right hearing loss, persistent discharge and dizziness. His audiogram shows conductive hearing loss in the same ear and his otoscopy is as followed. What cranial nerve paralysis would you expect to see in this condition? <coughs> So if we go to the answer. So um, the picture shows a cholesteatoma um, and kind of the, the clues in the, you could have got it with the, the symptoms of well, which is this kind of chronic conductive hearing loss with persistent discharge. So it's particularly described as like a smelly um, ear that's always getting infected um, and when it can progress quite severely it can go on and produce these other symptoms such as a facial nerve palsy so the answer is the facial nerve palsy um, and that's because of the anatomy where the facial nerve palsy comes out. Um, a cholesteatoma it's kind of this um, growth in the ear and it produces this pocket um, and it's not really um, a cancer but it ca it is a bit of a ENT red flag condition um, because it can go on to produce um, complications such as meningitis and it can cause permanent hearing loss so you want to do an audiogram see its conductive hearing loss and you want to do a CT of your um, petrous temporal bones. And then management is um, surgical management. So you need to um, clean out the ear, get rid of all that gunk um, and reconstruct the um, eardrum. And then you may also need to reconstruct the ossicles um, if it's destroyed them as well. And then on the otoscope, so in that picture, um, kind of diagnostic, it was kind of this pearly, waxy appearance. And then you've kind of got that um, attic appearance of that kind of um, yellow ball that's pushing back. It's kind of sucking in the eardrum. So next case. So case five, so it's a 56 um, year old um, male presents to the GP with vertigo. The last, the attack, the vertigo lasts four seconds and it's when he moves his head. No hearing loss, no tinnitus. How would you man definitively manage this patient? Get to the answer. So this is a vertigo question and um, the answer is the Epley's manoeuvre because this is BPPV um, and uh, it's particularly benign um, paroxysmal positional so whenever it's positional so whenever they move their head they get this vertigo that classically lasts a couple of seconds um, and they won't get hearing loss or tinnitus and it's quite a common question to get because the two manoeuvres you do the Dix Hall Pike manoeuvre is the um, diagnostic manoeuvre and then the treatment is the Epley's manoeuvre and then I'll let you guys look at um, this on your own time but it's other causes of vertigo something to be um, 
aware of when you're given um, differentials or thinking of differentials of vertigo um, in your uh, finals is peripheral causes, outer causes of vertigo, so those are your ear condition, and don't forget central causes of vertigo, so that's MS and strokes and migraines. And um, move on to the next case. So case six. So you're an F1 and you're asked to see a patient for um, a painless epistaxis, a uh, nosebleed, on a 45-year-old patient on the liver ward. His um, nosebleed has been going on for two minutes. Um, how would you immediately manage this patient with a nosebleed? So encouraged to spit out the blood. Um, sit the patient up and forward, ensure they have an adequate airway, compress for 20 minutes or pinch the nose and make them sit back. So we go to the answer when you're ready. So this is a question about uh, nosebleeds um, and the answer is uh, uh, C. So you want to, any, any kind of nosebleed, um, you want to make sure that the patient's airway is um, not compromised. So you always do an A to E assessment in every um, patient and A is the first one because that blood, if it's quite a vicious nosebleed, that blood could block off the airway. So you want to make sure they've got the adequate airway. From, from then onwards, after you've done your quick A to E, you then want to, you'll get stuck on C, which is um, circulation, and that's when you're monitoring the bleeding. So you want the patient to sit up and forward, and so that's so the blood can naturally come down the nose, um, or if it's more of a posterior nose bleed, it will go down the back of the throat. Do not um, encourage them to pinch your nose and sit, um, put your head back, like my mum always told me to do, because that's, you could actually um, go down the airway, and that's how they could actually choke on the blood um, and as long and along with making them sit up and forward encourage them to spit out the blood when it's um, coming out. If that's not working then you can try compression for 20 minutes um, and you can try ice at the bridge of the nose to make the blood vessels vasoconstrict. If compression and sitting forward hasn't helped then you're calling ENT because you want them to come and cauterize the bleeding. If cauterizing isn't working then they can try adrenaline soaked gauze and then if that's not working then ENT can um, do some packing um, but just for F1 um, when to call out a major hemorrhage in a nosebleed is when it's a nosebleed of more than 10 minutes or the patient's compromised. And so next case. So this is a uh, case of 14 year old boy presents to a &E with nose pain and swelling. He was playing rugby. He got tackled to the side. He's got no bleeding, no other injuries. When you're examining the nose, you see this. Um, hopefully the picture's clear enough. Um, but that's what you see when you're looking up the nose. How are you going to manage this patient? Um, are you going to do incision and drainage? Are you going to refer him to ENT within seven days? Are you going to discharge him with some pain relief? Uh, get CT of the face bones or do manipulation um, and anaesthetics. And so should we go to the answer? So this is a question on nose trauma. So uh, put in a uh, box again about all the different nose traumas you might see. Uh, you guys can go in, go through it in your own time. But I've put this was a picture of a septal hematoma. Um, so what you'll see is typically when there's trauma, um, the cartilage and the perichondrium will rip apart and a hematoma will form. And so when you look up the nose, it's really important to look inside the nose. It's often missed. And you'll see this kind of red, purple swelling in the septum. This is urgent um, incision and drainage. You need to get rid of that hematoma immediately because it can potentially compromise that airway. Um, and if not, you could compromise that airway, um, but it could also lead to avascular necrosis. Process, um, and the patient will be left with a um, saddle nose deformity um, and they 
they won't be um, very happy uh, at all. And then just so you know, um, there's also nasal fractures and lacerations up there for you guys to look at in your own time. So I think the next case. So 18 year old male presents to GP with a frontal headache, permanent nasal discharge, nasal congestion for seven days, past medical history of asthma. What is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? So we've got allergic rhinitis, viral rhinosinitis, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, bacterial rhinosinusitis, sorry, can't say that, um, and also facial pain syndrome. And so if we go to the answer when you're ready. Um, yeah, I can see it. So this is uh, acute uh, rhinosinusitis um, and it's inflammation of the mucosal surface. Um, most common cause is viral. So that's why the answer is B, a viral rather than bacterial. Commonly, it's a viral in, um, infection, which will then turn on to bacterial. Um, it's commonly facial pain, nasal discharge. The nasal discharge will be um, kind of purulent compared to if it was allergic to where it's more likely to be just kind of clear and you also get this nasal blockage maybe altered smell and taste um, and it's a clinical diagnosis it's self-limiting and you just have to tell the patient that the symptoms will improve in two to three weeks and they just need to self-care with some pain release and decongestions um, you may consider um, steroids um, if there's no improvement within 10 days. So you tell them, expect it for two to three weeks, but if it's getting worse and it's not improving after 10 days, um, then come back and they can try some steroids. And then if obviously if you suspect that it's moved onto a bacterial infection, and um, then you give them antibiotics. Okay. So it's our last DNT question, I think. Oh, OK, great. Thank you guys for listening. Oh, wait, there's one more. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry>. okay. <laughs> I thought you meant that was my last. OK, so this is a 21 year old female who presents a GP with a really severe sore throat. She's got a fever, a headache and a muffled voice. Her, she's got high temperature, 38.2. Heart rate's 120 uh, she's got normal. What's the most appropriate management? So and that's what you see when you let down her throat. So just give her some pain relief, some pain relief and penicillin B, pain relief penicillin G, urgent referral to ENT, urgent referral to A&E. Okay, hmm. if we go to the answer. So this is Quincy. Um, it's a serious complication of tonsillitis and it does happen. This actually happened to my best friend and we had to urgently refer her to A&E because she needs, uh, they'll need urgent admission for IV antibiotics, uh, incision and drainage or needle aspiration because that um, abscess and that you, what you'll see in that throat in that picture is extensive swelling erythemia and you've got your um deviated uvula to the um other side and um, that's causing blockage of the airway and that's why you'll get these symptoms of um uh, a muffled voice um and not, not being able to breathe as well and that's an emergency that and urgently needs to go to ant a and e Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Lizzie. It's some great questions. No, that's okay. Thank you guys for um, listening. Sorry, it was a bit rushed. Thank you very much. So I'm going to really briefly, I've got maybe five, ten minutes worth of questions on cardiovascular and plastics, and then that's the end of our session. Thank you so much, all of you, for sticking with us. Um, so I will start off with peripheral vascular disease. 
So which of these symptoms is most indicative of peripheral arterial disease? Guys, please do try and put your answers in the chat. Just have a go. That's all right. If not, I can um, I can go through them. There's nothing that's come through yet. That's all right. Yeah. Fine. So, oh, got a C. Oh yeah, thank you very much. C is brilliant. So, it is indeed C. So, um, this is a really specific symptom, and it's called intermittent claudication. It's a key feature of peripheral arterial disease. Um, leg ulcers, yes, it can happen in peripheral arterial disease. It can also happen in venous disease as well, uh, and diabetic foot and things like that. Distended veins are more common in peripheral venous disease. Peripheral neuropathy is more associated, more commonly associated with diabetes. And then unilateral calf pain is much more associated with PE than with vascular disease. So what's the most appropriate first investigation to order if you're suspecting peripheral arterial disease? Again, if you put your answers in the chat. Got, an, got a couple A's coming through, a few A's here. Yeah, brilliant. So it is A. So, um, so normal ankle brachial pressure index is over 0.9. Mild disease is 0.8 to 0.9. Moderate disease 0.5 to 0.8. And severe disease or critical limb ischemia is less than 0.5. So there is an equation for this, which you don't really have to know for your exams. But just to be aware, the way we measure ABPI is to take um, blood pressure of the lower limb and then divide that by pressure in the upper limbs. Um, and it's just um, you'll often have vascular specialist nurses that will come and, and do this for you. Um, but it's a re really good marker of how severe the patient's um, disease is. Doppler ultrasound we would probably do as well, but it's not the first thing that we would get done. Same with CTs and MRIs. Um, they become more relevant if we're planning to do surgery on somebody, um, but it's not the first thing that we would request. And then X-ray is not really a useful test for peripheral arterial disease. So which of these symptoms is a red flag for critical limb ischemia? You can probably rule out one of these from the questions we've just done. Here again, just answers in the chat, please. Got a B. Great. Yes, yeah, so it is B. Yeah. So ulcers or gangrene are a sign that the vascular supply is severely compromised, um, and, and that's the stage we call critical limb ischemia. Also, a sign of this is uh, ABPI less than 0.5, or if they've got pain, um, sort of lower leg pain that is not relieved by rest um, and is severe to the point of needing analgesia. All of those are red flag symptoms for critical limb ischemia. Um, pain on exertion that's relieved by rest is a symptom of peripheral arterial disease, but it's only a red flag if there's this persistent pain uh, at rest that goes on for longer than two weeks. Reduced mobility again can be a symptom, but it's not necessarily a red flag just on its own. We've mentioned the ABPI and lower leg swelling. Uh, swelling is not typically associated with peripheral arterial disease, um, but it might occur if they've got other conditions going on at the same time, particularly things like heart failure. And then what scoring system is used to classify limb ischemia? I'll just give it a little bit. I think there's a bit of a lag with the chat. The answer's coming okay. through the chat, so. Okay, got a couple of Ds, got an E in here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so so it's D. 
Um, e, you're very close, and I'll, I'll go into why in a second. So it is Rutherford. So Rutherford is uh, classified as Rutherford 1, which is a normal viable limb. 2A is a marginally threatened limb, so it, it definitely needs some sort of surgical input, but it's not an emergency. Uh, a 2B is if you don't do surgery now, they're probably going to lose their limb. And if it's Rutherford free, then it's too late. So the limb is already um, too compromised and they probably need an amputation at that point. Uh, Stanford, the reason I said Stanford is close is because it's also a vascular score. Um, but Stanford is used to classify aortic dissections, um, type A and B, whether they involve the aortic arch itself, which is type A, or type B, which is um, descending into the thoracic aorta. Rockwood is a frailty score. Hinchy classification is um, used to classify complications of diverticular disease. And a Rockall score is used to classify uh, upper GI bleeding. So another slightly different vascular question. So if you have a triple A that measures between 4.5 and 5.5 centimetres, how often should you monitor it? Just giving them a few seconds. So we've got an A, got C's coming through. Yeah. yeah. So the answer is C. So um, the general rule is if an aneurysm is between three and 4.4 centimetres, we monitor once a year. If it's between 4.5 and 5.5, we have to do it a bit more often than that every three months. Um, but if it's over 5.5, the patient really needs an urgent operation um, if they're fit for surgery. And there's a thing, Laplace's law, which states that the wider a vessel is, the thicker its walls need to be to contain the blood within that vessel. So if you've got a, um, a wide aneurysm, with thin walls, um, there's a higher and higher chance that that's going to rupture. OK, and then peripheral venous disease now. So venous ulcers are likely to be which of these? So let's give them a couple more seconds to answer. We've got A, B, D. OK, so a range of things. So we'll go through each one. So the answer is B. So venous ulcers are typically found uh, between the ankle and the knee. They're associated with specific skin changes. So you can have swelling, you can have skin thickening, um, which is also known as lipodermatosclerosis. Uh, you can get rashes um, and swelling as well. And you might see varicose veins associated with them as well. Um, A is typical of an arterial ulcer. So these are usually found sort of very distally on the um, sort of the toes or, or you know, nearly near the ball of the foot. Um, and this is because if you imagine that's right at the end of the arterial supply. Um, so if the arterial supply is, is compromised, that's the bit that's going to lose the circulation first. Um, and the arterial ulcers are often really painful, whereas venous ulcers are not um, not so often uh, as painful. If they're on the ball of the foot specifically, as in a, an area of pressure where that person's walking, uh, this is more likely to be associated with diabetic foot. And the reason for that is because of peripheral neuropathy. If they can't feel where they're putting their foot, quite often you'll get people who are sort of damaging um, and getting an ulcer on their foot and they're not realising because they can't feel it um, and then just carrying on walking on it um, and then it can often get quite bad. Not responsive to pressure bandaging, so venous ulcers are definitely, they're treated with pressure bandaging. Um, it's arterial ulcers that you shouldn't bandage. Um, and the reason for that is if you're tightly bandaging venous ulcers, you're encouraging that venous return, um, which is, you know, the venous stasis is what's part of the peripheral venous disease in the first place. Um, and discharging permanent fluid, it can happen to venous ulcers, but it, it's a sign of infection. So it's not 
something that's a specific to a venous ulcer. Okay, and then a plastics related question now. So which of these is an example of a wound healing by secondary intention? Just give it a few more seconds. Got C, got a B, mm -hmm. another C coming through. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. So yeah, so the answer is C. So the point about primary and secondary intention. So primary intention is usually, um, you know, a clean, for example, a surgical wound or a straight cut that you can meet the two edges together, whether that's with glue or sutures or steri strips or whatever but you can get those two edges to meet um, and then that encourages the wound to heal. The reason C is the correct answer is because you've got a cavity, so the abscess has been washed out in theatre and it's left a hole which we're packing with gauze. So healing by secondary intention is when we're allowing something to heal from the bottom up, but the two edges of the wound are not actually, they're not meeting each other um, and these sort of take longer to heal, but it means that with that pyelonodal abscess for example if we were to just stitch it together you would be left with this hole underneath which wouldn't heal effectively uh, which is why we tend to leave things like that open and then here just a general surgery uh, sort of question um, and sort of plastics as well I guess what classification of wound contamination is correct in these I think just give them a bit to read through all of them. Yeah. So. Okay, we've got a couple C's that came through. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah well done so c is the correct answer so that is the correct definition for a contaminated wound um a clean wound um is um ah yeah sorry so a and b i've mixed them up so um a clean wound is the definition that's listed in b so a clean wound is elective it's non-emergency um, and all the visceral tracts are intact. A clean contaminated, that's the definition I've put with A. So this is an emergency or urgent surgery where we have opened some of the visceral tracts, but there's minimal spillage and there's no infection within those tracts. Um, a dirty um, wound is it's not just a person getting an infection because that can happen, unfortunately, with any surgery, but the correct definition is purulent inflammation such as an abscess or a perforation that is over four hours old so if it's under four hours old and um, it's contaminated if it's over four hours or there's pus there then it's dirty and then this is the last question of the night so um, what is the name of the rule that's used in determining extent of burn damage to the skin We've got loads of people saying D. Yeah, fantastic. So it is indeed, it's Wallace's rule of nines. And here is a quick diagram. So the, the principle is that you're splitting the body into percentages of nine, the head and neck being 9%, the upper limbs uh, make up 9% each. The trunk is um, four lots of nine because it's four separate areas, two on the front and two on the back. Um, just the genitals on their own make up a whole percent and that's because as you can imagine if you have burns in that area it could be very very serious and damaging um, and the lower limbs are back uh, nine percent so that's 18 percent each and that is all the questions so thank you very much for sticking with us to the end um it's been a really good session and i hope you found it useful it would be really helpful if you could fill out the feedback for us guys if you can do that, uh, we can send you 
um, sort of copies or you'll have access to a copy of the questions. And we, there were actually more questions that we didn't present tonight um, that you can go through in your own time um, if that's helpful for your revision as well. I think 